2024 training camp is seven days away, and the guy that's wearing number seven has a lot of weapons to utilize with the wide receiving core. You are Locked On Texans, your daily podcast on the Houston Texans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in, everybody, to this Thursday episode of the Locked On Texans podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you to all of our first time listeners and viewers. Do us three favors uh, subscribe, like, and comment to the Locked On Texans podcast on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Also, thank you to our everydayers mm. from the Himalayas looking yes, over down from the top of the Texans mountain. Thank you all for coming back. As Cody and I continue to talk Texans, I'm your Texans football analyst, John, some sports guy, Hickman, on the other side of the screen. It's Texans Credential Media, member Sports Illustrated's own Cody Davis. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Gotta catch them all. <laughs> Texas receivers. We talking receivers today. Cody, take us away. Yes, sir. We're going to continue our position breakdown heading into the 2024 training camp, looking at the wide receiving unit, which means we're all officially on the offensive side of the ball. John, I think previewing the offense heading into training camp is probably going to be the easiest until we get to the running back position. But today we're going to talk about the wide receiving core and look, we're going to keep the same thing. We're going to talk about guys who are on the bubble. We're going to look at the biggest storyline at that position, but we're going to start with grading coach D'Amico Rhines and general manager, Nick Casario, and looking at how they revamp their yes. wide receiver unit. And John, they only made one change. Everybody that you know are coming back. Do I need to, you know, give the listeners and viewers the names of all the receivers that's coming back? It's basically the same guys. Nico Collins, Tay Dale, thankfully, given everything he's been through over the past six to eight months, he is officially 100% right. back. Noah Brown, John Mechie, Xavier Hutchinson, Steven Sims, Jared Wayne, Johnny Johnson the third. But that's you only... Yo, oh, oh newcomer! Look, I'm so excited about the only new newcomer that really, you know, their their biggest offseason acquisition. But you know, you got Ben Skorani. By the way, I had an opportunity to meet him at one of the Houston Texans community event. Really good guy. I'm already a fan. Cannot wait to do some good work with him throughout the regular season. However, the biggest acquisition the Houston Texans made was trading for Stephon Diggs. Another easy one, John. We can look at this and come to an agreement. We're grading general manager Nick Casario, head coach D'Amico Ryans. We would both like to give them an A. John, do you want to break this position group down? Yeah, it's an A for me. It's an A for me. Um, I, and I, I believe it's an A because, for one, the addition of Diggs at the mm -hmm. top, right? We look at the top three. Diggs at the top now looks a whole lot different than Nico Collins, Tank Dale, and Noah Brown or Nico Collins, mm. Tank Dale, and uh, Robert Woods looks different. And regardless of how you feel about him, he has had six straight seasons of a thousand yards. I do think that between the departure of Ken Dorsey, the in season change at OC last year, and the Bills just not doing a good job adjusting to dig somewhat decline downfield, downfield ability, we saw somewhat of a productivity decline in digs. Mm -hmm. However, what Houston has in Tank Dale and Nico Collins gives Houston the well-rounded and balanced receiver room they've never had in franchise history. Mm. So a down year in Buffalo for Diggs is a luxury year in Houston with the pieces surrounding him. I do want to say this. In Buffalo, it was Diggs. You had Gabe Davis coming along, but at no point – do we feel like, based off last year, there was as much talent in that Buffalo room with Diggs compared to what Diggs will have here in Houston between Nate, uh, Nico Collins and Tank Dale? So, like, I, I think that's a huge upgrade. You look at Tank Dale, he's healthy after the scare this offseason. 
uh, as Cody just mentioned. Between the top guys you have in this group, Houston can hurt teams over the top and in the middle of the field with Nico Collins, who dominated over the middle and was one of the better wide receivers in the NFL against man. You got Tank Dell, who can do it all on the field. By the way, Tank Dell averaged 14.3 average depth of target last year. One of the better guys in the NFL at you know catching those passes, getting out deep, deeper into the field to hurt defenses. And Diggs is still a guy DCs have to game plan for. So they got a three-headed monster. And what I like about this unit is you got the Swiss Army knife, the do it all guy in Tank Dale. I believe he can hurt you deep. I mm. believe between 10 to 15. I believe he can hurt you between 16 and, and 12. He can hurt you on the sideline. He can hurt you in the middle of the field. What I like that you, you got that. You also got Nico Collins, who's going to average 15 yards per catch, who's going to be your big biter receiver that can make some of those difficult catches with guys surrounding him because he's able to out athletic other defenders around him and he's a big old target right he's a big target who understands how to get open now in the nfl and will hurt a team in the middle of the field and then now you add digs to this this group listen guys attitude aside regardless of how the year ended for digs because i do think the oc change impacted the play calling and how he was involved mm -hmm. the relationship just uh soured to all together Regardless of that, Diggs is a guy with six straight 1,000-yard receiving seasons. Will he have his seventh here in Houston? We'll see. But, again, if he has 900 yards, then maybe you're looking at your top two receivers having 1,000. Houston has never had that before. And that's what I think I'm most excited about the addition of Stephon Diggs because, John, as you just alluded to, I mean, when you take a look at the greatest wide receivers in franchise history, it was always Andre Johnson, and that's it mainly D hop and basically that's it. I know a lot of people might scratch their head and say, well, what about Will Fuller? Will Fuller was never healthy and the rest of that wide receiving core was always a hit or miss. Um, even with Brandon Cooks, I mean, yeah, you had a, a, a rookie, um, you know, Nico Collins at the time, but I mean, it was really a lot of times just Brandon Cooks and that's it. Now that's what I love so much about this team. And I talked about this a, a couple weeks ago on this show, like, when you see C.J. Stroud take the field and look at the weapons and you look at that wide receiving court and see that he has an opportunity to connect with Stephon Diggs, um, Tank Dell, and Nico Collins, man, it, it's saying a lot. And also it goes into I love how the way that the addition of Stephon Diggs also helped this wide receiving core. It, it, this this might be the deepest position that the Texans have at, at any position group because yes we talked a lot about the three other guys but what about John Mechie who looked damn good doing OTAs and mandatory minicamp what about Xavier Hutchinson who looked really good doing OTAs and mandatory minicamp but look I want to make sure I give this guy credit because I don't know if we're going to have an opportunity to mention his name but Jaden Janky the undrafted wide receiver that you signed doing uh, follow Yankee sorry um. Even he had an opportunity to go out there and make plays. And, John, I know when we look at the biggest storyline at this position group, we're definitely going to highlight Jerry Wayne, a guy who came into came into yes. the league last year. And we yes. literally watched this young man look better and better and better almost every single week at practice. Now it's definitely seemed like that Coach D'Amico Ryan's Bobby Sloak, and everybody else involved is definitely going to give this young man a real opportunity to showcase what he can do in training camp. So we definitely going to take a look at Jerry Wayne and the rest of this wide receiving core and look at some of the biggest storylines entering training camp in 2024. Before we talk about the receivers and the biggest storyline for the Houston Texans coming out of that group, it's very important to let you guys know where you can catch – Great deals on either NFL games, Astro games. Make sure you check out Locked On Astros. Want to watch some Rockets? Or you want to go on a date and go to a concert where you can catch the best prices and great deals? Game time. Killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying Tickets. You ain't got to guess no more. Uh, uh, what should I do? Where should I go? I'm telling you guys right now. Go to Game Time, the app. What makes Game Time so great? Well, for one, 
your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry and their lowest price guarantee. That means if you find a ticket somewhere else cheaper in the same section or row, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Ain't nothing to guess about. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB, NFL, or any concert tickets, any sporting events. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code locked on NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K O N N F L locked on NFL for twenty dollars off your per- your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Uh, last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back in Locked On Texans listeners and viewers. Please be sure that you are not only listening and watching the Locked On Texans podcast, but that you're also checking out the Locked On Rockets podcast as well on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Cody, before I give it over to you and we look at the biggest storylines at the wide receiver position, I do want to say that the Shanahan offense is a very friendly offense for receivers. Oh, yeah, most definitely. That's so, part of the reason why we've seen uh, uh, in the offense alike <laughs> what's going on in San Francisco have a plethora of guys who look right. really, Nico really good. Nico last year. Mm-hmm. Nico, Nico last, last year. year. But um, Julio in, in 2015 with Kyle Shanahan. Mm-hmm. Andre Johnson under Gary Kubiak. He's mm. a part of that Shanahan tree. Uh, Brandon Ayuk, who's gotten better and better in San Francisco under Kyle Shanahan. Mm-hmm. I wanted to say that to say this kind of piggybacking off of the first segment and leading us into the big storylines. If you have the talent, this offense, you'll find a way to eat. And they have three top heavy, heavy hitters, but the bottom three guys should also find a way to eat on this, on this roster with this offense. Since we're talking about biggest storyline, John, Uh let's jump in the call let's go on the time machine listeners and viewers let's go on the time machine let's go back to 2009 2010 well we're not going to stop in the nfl we're going to go to the nba we're going to go to boston 2009 yeah 2009 2010 let's go let's go 2010 yeah well i can't say that i've been wearing glasses (laughs) since i was six but and and let's go to the nba let's make a stop at you know boston and take a look at the boston celtics remember they big three but around 2010, you know, there was the Ray Allen, the Paul Pierce, and the Kevin Garnett. But around 2010, there was a guy that wore number nine, the point guard, by the name of Rajon Rondo that said, you know what, forget the big three. This is the big four. Right. And then we saw him take that next step, and it's like, oh, damn. Now we have to literally not only care about these future Hall of Famers, but now we also got to take a look at this rising all-star point guard the reason why i'm bringing that up because look for me mm. the biggest storyline coming in the training camp i want john mechie to it's take that place, same bro. approach just like ray john rondo about a decade ago we sit here a lot all of us everybody the writers the radio hosts the 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 the, the, the bloggers the fans everybody it's talking about how good the Houston Texans wide receiving core when you look at the big three, Tate, Nico, and Diggs. But I truly believe that John Mechie has an opportunity to turn this in from the big three into the big four. And I'm not just saying that because I've been singing John Mechie praises ever since they drafted him. We already yeah. know his story. Yeah, I know I have. We already <laughs> know his story. We already know what that young man has been through. You guys already know how I feel. I thought last year was a red shirt year. And after watching him doing OTAs and mandatory minicamp, I believe that the Houston Texans will have an opportunity to get the guy that they drafted and get the guy that we watch become one of the best wide receivers coming out of Alabama in 2022. I think this is going to be the year. And by the way, I just pulled up some of my notes on the first day of mandatory minicamp. 
John Mechie looked explosive like we saw at Alabama. He looked so explosive, so shifty to the point he put Darius Stingley Jr. in the blender not once but twice. And you know how we feel about Darius Stingley Jr. We are looking at that man as a potential all-pro cornerback. And if he ain't all-pro, I'm pretty sure he's going to be a Pro Bowl cornerback. Right. And if he can do that to Derek Stingley Jr., what do you think he's going to have an opportunity to do when he is lined up and, uh, along with Nico and Dig and Tank, who you know the opposing team is going to have an opportunity to look at them more so than John Mechie? And doing that first day of mandatory minicamp, the man with three for four receptions ran with the first and the second team, and this young man went out there and made plays. That's going to be my biggest storyline in training camp, looking at John Mechie. I think for Mitchell, he has to separate himself. And I think what works in his favor is, unlike the top three guys, there's not a lot of film on you at the NFL level. Guys, guys got to go back and kind of scout you from college, your last you know season in college, to kind of get a feel for John Mitchell. And to that point, really quick, I'm glad that you brought that up because the player that he was in college, I think we're going to get a better version of him, not skill-wise, but mentally. There was several moments where me and John Mechie talked in his locker, and he just talked about, hey, regardless of what went on with me over these last couple of um, years, he was like, it gave me an opportunity to literally sit back and develop develop my skill set from a mental standpoint, and that's going to work in his favor as well. It absolutely will. And again, you look at being stronger in that aspect and – Having somewhat of the advantage over your defender. Like, I think going into this year, teams may blanket, depending on the down or depending on what coverage, they may blanket Nico a little bit more because, I mean, he destroys man one-on-one -on -one coverage. Mm -hmm. So that defender may need some help over the top, right? With John Mechie, right, and you know what, what Stefan Diggs can do, you know, intermediate or – maybe a little bit more out there between the, the 10 and 15. You don't really know much about John Mechie in the NFL, and, and I think that'll help him out. I mean, you know, my biggest storyline, you mentioned the Boston Celtics and KG, because I'm going to stick with that. KG just talked about hmm. the other day with that big three of Paul Pierce, Ray Allen, and them boys, man. He said one player that he was shocked and surprised – to see be as good as he was and around this time, that's when him and Rondo was bonding together. Avery Bradley, right? Mm. At that guard spot. So from UT, right? From UT, you know <laughs> it. But I want to look at the pit guy, and that's Jerry Wayne. Like, you guys want to know why I like Jerry Wayne, really, though? Like um, his last year at Pitt, you know, he came out last year. His average depth of target in 2022 was nearly 15. Yards and that was on 93 targets, mm. right? He had 44.3 percent of his team's passing yards at a power five school in 2022. He's 6'3, ran about a four five, right? Uh, topped out around a four five. His best year at Pitt 18.5 yards per carry. That was his last year, but that was his best year. And he also has a 41.5 vertical. Big guy, four five. Mm. You know, he kind of reminds me of a little bit. Sound very familiar. Like a guy that just had a career year in a system that allows receivers to have career years. And he, he puts me in the mind of Nico Collins. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily saying the same talent. Uh, and I'm not even expecting the same production. But what I'm getting at is when I look at the top three, I look at the bottom three. Mm -hmm. What guy can mirror the starter in front of them. With John Mitch, I think he can mirror a little bit of Stefan Diggs. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and and Tank, but at this stage of his career, a little bit of Stefan Diggs with the rock runner being able to create that separation and then picking up some yak yards. But when I look at Nico and I look at Jerry Wayne, there's some similarities there. Big body receiver that can hurt a defense over the top uh, in the middle of the field and can make those contested catches because of his frame and his length. So I I think my biggest storyline, not even I think, my biggest storyline is looking at if that undrafted practice squad player from last year who has put in the work, right, all last season, this offseason, can that forgettable story for some people start to become a noticeable name? And I'm not going to mm. say household. There's 
not a lot of names become household names, right? Mm-hmm. And, and in this group, you got three. So you're not going to get a little bit more than that. Mechie is a household name. I'll say Mechie. <laughs> can he become a noticeable name? If so, what is he doing to become a noticeable name, right? Mm-hmm. And if he's doing that, who is he beating out? I'm also going to say this. Depending on the offense Houston wants to run this year, are we going to see some wide zone offense where it's making it a little bit easier for Joe Mixon in the backfield to kind of have his way running the ball because teams are worried about the pass? Does Houston want to be a bombs over Baghdad type of offense where 15 yards per catch, 17 yards per catch, they're attacking teams down the middle of the field and big plays? Depending on that offense, where does that leave Noah Brown and Robert Woods? The older guys, especially Robert Woods. Noah Brown can still make a case for himself. He was a big play receiver for Houston last year. Uh, a lot of big moments for Houston to help them keep their playoff hopes alive and ultimately make the playoffs and win a playoff game. But if they want to be a down-the-field team, does Houston go youth over veterans? Over age, and if they do, then I could see a scenario where both Jerry Wayne and Xavier Hutchinson has an edge over those other two receivers. But I like Jerry Wayne to make this roster. Mm, I like Jerry Wayne making a roster, and I tell you this: Jerry Wayne would not be a guy on the bubble, in my opinion, entering training camp. So on the other side of the break, we're gonna take a look at guys who are on the bubble. You guys should already know who we gonna pick. Welcome back, Locked On Texas listeners and viewers. We are not in 2009 anymore, so I can get my glasses <laughs> back on. We in 2024. Uh, a lot of crazy changes since 2009. Lot. Sheesh. Uh, egg <laughs> prices, inflation with groceries, gas prices. But, again, one of the biggest changes is in 2009, <clears throat> aside from uh, Andre Johnson, who were the Texans receivers? <laughs> I can't hear right. uh, that I team was nine and seven. Let's take a look at it. No, D'Amico's on that team. Oh, I oh, think that was his last year. No, his last year was in 11 or 12, 11. I think. 11. Yeah. Okay. It was Kevin Walter. Mm. Mm. Kevin mm. Kevin mm. Walter was the last, was, was the receiver next to Andre Johnson, uh, compared to now in 20. 24, you, you you got noticeable names that you, you absolutely know. Yeah, Glenn Martinez, Jacoby Jones was on that team, Andre Davis. Houston only carried five receivers, and, you know, again, a big change from 2009 to 24, 2024, excuse me. Mm. But on the bubble, entering training camp, who you got? Noah Brown. I know that name might surprise some people. But when I was at mandatory minicamp, um, look, I mean, this, this really comes down between Noah Brown and Robert Woods. However, Robert Woods was out there, you know, looked like he was giving his all. Noah Brown, I mean, it's mandatory minicamp, and he spent every single practice on the sideline. And I look at that from a standpoint, when you add a guy like Stephon Diggs and you have now expanded your depth, And even when you take a look at the potential jump that we could see from John Mechie and Xavier Hutchison, even Jerry Wayne, to your point that you made in the last segment, John, I look at somebody like Noah Brown and I'm thinking to myself, yes, you did make some plays. Yes, you did help this team become a playoff a playoff team in 2023. But now due to all the changes and the jumps and improvements that we're about to see, Will the Houston Texans keep you around knowing that every two to three games you're dealing with a hamstring injury or a shoulder injury or a foot injury? You know, and I truly believe Mm. that Noah Brown is talented, but I just think at this point, especially considering that this team championship aspirations and John, just like you mentioned, I think it was last week or earlier this week when you brought to the fact that Coach D'Amico Ryan's and Nick Casario is definitely going to put the best players out there on the field each and every day. I look at Noah Brown and I'm thinking to myself, if you already dealing with injuries at mandatory mini camp, how in the world can this team depend on your availability come training camp, come preseason, come the regular season, come the playoffs, and hopefully February Super Bowl? <laughs> right. And especially when guys are getting more comfortable in that offense with, you know, 
him not having an opportunity to go into year two, start year two off mm. uh, with that opportunity to get more comfortable with the offense, you know, the changes, different dialogues, a whole nine. So I can see both Robert Woods. I do see both Robert Woods and Noah Brown on the bubble. Uh, those are my two guys, but a player that I really think could shake things up. And it may not be at the wide receiver position, even though he is listed at wide receiver. He could be an ace back. He, I, I, I see the potential of him moving over to a tight end, maybe, depending on how competitive that group looks. That's Ben Skoranek. Mm. Houston traded for him from the L.A. Rams. He's coming from the same system. Um, has a lot of familiarity with this system and what this offense wants to look like especially when you look at the physicality he brings. Again, I don't know if he's going to make this roster as a receiver or make the roster at all, but I do think because of his Swiss Army knife ifs that he brings, he has a lot of you know different tools you, you like out of a football player. He can kind of shake some things up. If guys are not going to go out there and be physical and do some of that dirty work, and then you're looking and we're looking and saying, well, with the pads on right now, he just opened up a, a lane for Damian Pierce or Jawar Jordan to crack off a nice run. Who was on that block? Oh, that was Ben Skronik. Hmm. Right. If he's doing things like that, with how this team has preached physicality and, and, and how they want this offense to look, not saying he's going to take somebody's spot, but it's going to be very difficult to beat out a player who is a scrappy player, honestly, man. So uh, I think this wide receiver group, uh, it has a chance to disappoint us in a good way. No. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. Like, I mean, what if, what if, what if, and we, we, we both love Jerry Wayne and we just advocated for him to make this roster. But uh, Ben Skoranek, I believe, is what, 6'2? 6'3? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. NFL regular season experience. Not to say Jerry Wayne can't do it again. I want to see him become a noticeable name. But Houston traded for that man. And I think that's because he does some things that on film, on the field, they really love. So he's 6'3". 6'3", 6'3", 220, 215? 6'3", 224. 224. And he'd have got to Houston and been eating Papados. <laughs> and other, 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 other seven spots. Yeah. So 224, maybe 232 now. It, you know, you know. But um, interesting player, man. I think he's a very intriguing player. I'm not going to – because I thought last year Alec Bachman was an intriguing player. He was making plays through our camp. Mm-hmm. I think he comes in with a little bit more range as a player and expectation as a guy that they traded for. So mm. uh, he will be fun to watch. Thank you guys for watching and listening to today's episode of the Locked On Texans podcast. Please subscribe on YouTube. Like and comment. Follow on Twitter at Locked On Texans. Follow me on Twitter at John underscore Hickman 12. Also, if you are still in need of supplies or cooling stations, whatever it may be, if you follow me on Instagram at Some Sports Guy, I've been reposting them on my story as well. Um, Houston Strong, Houston Together, the whole nine, man. If you need help, there's resources out there. And as always, I'm your host, Cody M. Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, it's Cody C-O-T-Y-D-A-V-I-S underscore 24. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace. We're praying for y'all.